Good morning. There is a, an air of expectation approaching one of the biggest holidays around the world and a uh, time that we get to spend together with, uh, with family, with uh, loved ones and uh, one of the very familiar things that we see in the nativity scenes all around us are, are the three uh, magi and so I want to spend some time talking about uh, that this morning. Um, let's go to Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. And here's what we have in the text about those uh, figures that we see in those uh, nativity scenes. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him, gathering together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they said to him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this is what has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are by no means least among the leaders of Judah. For out of you shall come forth a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called the Magi, and determined from them the exact time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for the child. And when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. After hearing the king, they went their way, and the star which they had seen in the east went on before them, until it came and stood over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And after coming into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell to the ground and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And having been warned by God in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. Now, if you notice, a lot of the details that we think uh, about these uh, about these folks, uh, we don't find them actually in the text. We don't know exactly how many they were. Most, I think, most uh, depictions that uh, portray three of them, probably because there were three gifts. But who were they? Who were these uh, mysterious people that came from the east? and appeared and honored Jesus, and then uh, they went their way. We never hear from them again. Several years ago, uh, when I had access to a university library, I went and did some research and some digging about these folks, and I was surprised by what I found. And I want to share that with you this morning. Hopefully, uh, hopefully what I have for you this morning will encourage you and instruct you. And so the question is... Were these people kings or were they wise men? It's interesting when you go back and you look at how these legends evolved over the years about these particular people. Earlier legends actually have, have them as kings that came from the east. In fact, you may remember the song, We Three Kings of Orient. And so where did this legend came from? And I found that this actually came sometime in the Middle Ages after Constantine. This is a time when Christianity was no longer an illegal religion. It became a legal religion, and in fact, at uh, some point, it actually became the only legal religion. And we saw in history the rise of Christian monarchs, and we saw that the church uh, acquired ruling power. And so a lot of people during those years read Scripture through the lens of a church-controlled government. And so when they read this text... They saw these people as kings and as one of several texts that legitimized the existence of Christian monarchs. And that legend remained intact until we come uh, much later to the Renaissance and Reformation. 
Many people rejected the idea that the church should have any political power at all. And instead of seeing these men as uh, kings, uh, people began to see them as wise men. And wise men were people who were scribes or sages, people that had an education. And a lot of the art during this peri period uh, depicted these men as wearing the scholar's gown rather than the royal robes uh, from the art of the uh, previous centuries. And so as I was looking at this, it seemed like <coughs> the view of who these people were were influenced heavily by the culture around them. Earlier when the church was in the seat of ruling power, they were kings. And later when there was a rise and a rebirth of learning uh, in the Renaissance, they began to see them as wise men, as learned men, as scholars. And so I began to look a little bit closer uh, at, at uh, who these men were and I found that uh, their most definitely, probably not wise men. The word that would have been used is a different word, sophoi, which have been a wise men, and that's not what's used there. The word is magi. And they weren't kings. The word that's used there is not kings either. But Matthew seems to take for granted that when he mentions that magi came from the east, that is people, that the original readers would know who the magi were. The only thing we know from them is that they came from the, about them is they came from the east. Uh, a lot of people think that's from Babylon. It was from the east, which would have made sense. There was a large Jewish population there left over from the years of captivity. And uh, that's where a lot of Jewish scribes and scholars and rabbis came from was in Babylon. In fact, one of the uh, uh, writings that Jews often refer to are th is the Talmud, and that was actually produced in uh, Babylon. And so these men uh, in, in a place with such a large Jewish population probably would have been familiar with uh, messianic Jewish expectations. So that maybe that's where, they, where it came from. Then I looked a little bit closer at the uh, word magi, and I found was kinda, what I found was kind of interesting. Uh, the word actually comes from a Latin word, uh, magus. Uh, Greek, it was magos, so it's actually what's here in the text. And what I found about who magi, magus, magos, depending on how you say it, what they were, is a little bit uh, surprising to me. In Jewish literature, they're almost always portrayed in a uh, negative light. When you look at uh, Jewish writings about pharaohs, uh, wise men or magicians, they're depicted as magoi. magoi. In Jewish writings and commentary, I always saw them, these uh, magi, as bumbling idiots. Think about the uh, men that Pharaoh uh, had, in his, uh, had in his service that uh, think about the time when Moses and Aaron came and they had that face off and you remember when Moses and Aaron came to uh, to Pharaoh and said let my people go and there was a contest uh, Aaron took his staff threw it on the ground you remember what it became it became a became a snake right and then Pharaoh's magicians and conjurers threw theirs on the ground they also became snakes but Aaron's snake swallowed up their uh, their snake and so they were without their staffs or what about the first plague when, uh, when uh, Moses went down to the Nile River and he struck it and it all became blood? Pharaoh's magicians, when they came, they couldn't do anything to get rid of it. But what they could do was produce some blood of their own from water, as if that were really a solution. And then there were the plague of frogs. Can you imagine waking up in the morning and stepping down out of your bed and there being frogs and frogs uh, running across your running across your bed, you go to the oven and there's frogs in your oven and uh, I know some of you have had to deal with uh, little pestilent sorts of things like that before, right? And so I think you might be able to imagine what that must have been like. And uh, so uh, Pharaoh's magicians, they show up and you know what they did? They didn't get rid of the frogs. They say, hey look, we can make frogs too, as if that were a solution. And so, I mean, over and over again, they show themselves to be ineffective and not able to do anything against the power of of God, and finally, when the when the plague of boils uh, showed up, they they were struck with the boils themselves, and they weren't even able to stand before uh, stand before Pharaoh. And then we have another character, a another uh, magician or magi, as it's called in Jewish literature, and Balaam. Most of us probably have a, are familiar a little bit with the story of Balaam. He was a man who practiced divination. Uh, he was a soothsayer. And Jewish literature usually portrays him also as a thick-headed idiot. 
There was, this was the, the time when uh, Israel was camped uh, in a neighboring area here, and Balak, the king, uh, saw Israel, and he felt threatened by them, and he knew of this soothsayer named Balaam, and he wanted to call him and say, you know, I want you to go, and I want you to curse these people. And God appeared to Balaam and said, I don't want you to go with those men. And yet when they showed up and they had all this money, the fees were his divination, he kept asking, God, do you really want me to go with them? God already told him he didn't want to go, but he kept asking. So God said, sure, go ahead and go with them. And along the way, as he's riding his donkey, an angel of the Lord stands in his way with a sword drawn, ready to strike him down. And if you remember the story, the donkey kept uh, swerving out of the way, uh, it would turn and pass into a field to keep him from being uh, struck down by this angel of the Lord with a sword until finally he was in a narrow place and the donkey couldn't go anywhere so he crushed his leg against the wall and Balaam cursed his donkey and began to beat him and if you remember the story the don donkey began to talk to him I have served you all these years why are you beating me and some people said you know I think of Mr. Ed you know the way he used to talk and so that's kind of a humorous scene here and, <clears throat> and Balaam after all of this, and he sees the angel of the Lord and realizes that the donkey saved his life, and God told him it could have struck you down. And, and so, uh, and Balaam says, uh, Okay, if it's dis displeasing for me to go, then I will go back. And I'm thinking, Well, do you think? And so, you know, uh, Balaam was portrayed as a bumbling idiot. And then you come to Daniel chapter 2, and this is where Nebuchadnezzar had uh, magicians or magi. Uh, in his uh, in, in uh, working for him, uh, the text in Daniel two calls them magicians, conjurers, and sorcerers. And if you remember the story there, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and evidently he must. I wonder if he suspected that those guys really were ineffective, because he said, "Okay, I don't want you just to interpret the dream for me. I want you to tell me the dream and then interpret interpret it for me." And of course they said, "Oh, nobody can do that." And word came to Daniel about this, and so he went to them, and by the power of God, he told them not only his dream, but the interpretation of the dream as well. And so, once again, these magicians, or magi, are ineffective, powerless, and useless. Philo, the philosopher from the, from the, uh, around the uh, uh, second, to, uh, second century said that magi, or, or magoi, the plural, are stupid, ignorant, experts at nonsense. They are learned, but not wise. And we actually have some of them in the New Testament as well. When we come to the New Testament, we come to Acts chapter 8. It uh, tells a story of a man named Simon. Simon, our Sunday school literature usually calls him Simon the what? Simon the magician. It's the same word, magi, it's the same word in the text as what we see here in, uh, in uh, chapter uh, 2 of Matthew. Simon the Magician, and if you remember the story, here was a man who used to wow people with his magic arts, and uh, then he became a Christian, he was baptized, and when he saw the apostles laying their hands and bestowing the Holy Spirit on people, he wanted some of that. He, I think he saw an opportunity to make some money, he wanted to buy that power so that he could do the same thing, and they told him they needed to re that uh, Simon needed to repent because his heart was not right and he was in bondage to iniquity and in the gall of bitterness. Then we come to Acts chapter 13, and there was this guy on Cyprus that, uh, that uh, Saul and Barnabas, uh, they went there on a mission trip, and they ran into this guy named Elymas, or Bar-Jesus as he was known, and he was another magician, another magi, or a magus, and he had tried to oppose Paul and his teaching, and so Paul struck him blind for a period of time, and people had to lead him around by the hand. Both of these... Uh, Magi were easily exposed as fraud. It, it's interesting when I went, went and looked up the Hebrew word for magi, it's actually M A G, it means soothsayer. And I believe our English word magic comes from the same root. So magi were magicians, they were, they were people who practiced divination, they were soothsayers, they were conjurers. And so the original readers probably would have understood these uh, magi in a very negative light. And as so I was thinking about that, the question became, why would, in the account of Matthew, why would that have been in included in this gospel? And I had to really think about that, because I think most of us probably realize that we don't have everything that ever happened in the life of Jesus 
in the gospel. It's selective in what it includes, and what it does include, it includes for a reason. In fact, John says in the very last chapter of the gospel of John that if you wrote down everything that Jesus ever did, there wouldn't be enough books to contain all of it. And so what we have, we have is for a reason, and it's selective. So what reason could this story have to be in the gospel? And I think it has, after thinking about it, it has something to do with the ideal for God's kingdom. Think about the people that Jesus chose uh, to be his representatives, his apostles. He didn't choose them from the religious elite, and he didn't choose them from the politically powerful. Some of them were fishermen. They were ordinary working people. Some of them, uh, then there was a tax collector, somebody that people, uh, that the Jews despised. There was a zealot who, uh, you wonder how a zealot and a tax collector would have gotten along because the zealot wanted everything to do with taxes and Rome, wanted to overthrow all that. But the, the point is that they were ordinary, everyday people. And uh, what Jesus wanted to demonstrate is that the kingdom of heaven belongs to the least of these. And, some, and, and even his apostles needed to learn that lesson. Remember when they were arguing over which of them was the greatest? And what did Jesus do? He took a child and he says, The kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. A child is someone who hasn't grown to become a great, powerful person of status. And that's basically what he was saying. Like this humble child, that's what the kingdom of heaven is like. In fact, if you look at... Go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 11. And let's read a couple of verses here. Matthew chapter 11, beginning with verse 25. Notice what Jesus gives thanks to God for. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. Yes, Father, for this way was well-pleasing in your sight. Not to the intelligent, to the powerful, to the elite, uh, in fact, for those people who were elite, Jesus said to leave them alone, for they are blind guides of the blind. The people that seemed to get it oftentimes were the weak, the nobodies, the people that were considered fools by other people, people that were childlike. How often did they get the message? And the irony when we look here in Matthew chapter 2 is who got it and who didn't get it. When Jesus shows up into the world, uh, Herod didn't get it. He was just concerned that there was somebody that might challenge his rule. The Jewish leaders, when they heard that he might be born, they, were, uh, they seemed to just go about their regular business. All of Jerusalem was just simply troubled. And yet, out of all of them, the people that seemed to get it, of all people, were these magi who came from the east. And I believe that this highlights an aspect of the kingdom where all of the norms are turned upside down. Jesus said that the kingdom belongs to the poor in spirit in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. Jesus also said that in the kingdom, the greatest becomes a servant and the service becomes the greatest. He also said that the humble are exalted and the exalted are humbled. The kingdom of heaven, he said, belongs to the poor. It's in the kingdom of heaven, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, that the nobody becomes somebody and the somebody becomes nobody. Or as in the scripture reading this morning reminds us, that it's those who are less honorable and less presentable, those members of the body receive more abundant honor than the more presentable members of the body. And it's interesting when you consider all of this that Matthew, and I think you may have heard this before, Matthew is a Jewish flavored gospel, right? This is a gospel that seems to be written with, to people that were familiar with uh, Jewish scriptures and Jewish background. So you've got all of these Old Testament quotations and so forth. And uh, in a gospel that was written with Jews in mind, it's amazing that you find this story in a Jewish flavored gospel. Because we know that Jews didn't have any dealings with Gentiles and they definitely would not have had any dealings with Magi, people who practiced sorcery and uh, divination. In fact, they despised them. And yet in Matthew, the very first acknowledgement of Jesus comes on the lips of these Magi who were Gentiles. And as I was thinking about that, I began to realize, you know what? 
the very last words, the very last acknowledgement of Jesus also comes on the lips of a Gentile. Do you remember when Jesus was crucified and he died, the veil in the, t in the temple was torn in two, the earth shook, the rocks were split, people came up out of the grave, and that centurion, when he saw all that Roman centurion that was there at the cross, you remember what he said? Surely this was the Son of God. And the irony is out of all the people uh, out of all the people that didn't get it, the people that did get it were these outsiders, these Gentiles. You know, and I think this also anticipates the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28. It's interesting when you look at the wording there. Because Jesus says, make disciples of all the what? All the nations. Now that word nation probably doesn't resonate in the same way with us as it probably did with the Jews. It would have resonated in a negative way uh, to Jews. Because to the Jews, there were God's people... And then there were the nation, everybody else, the nations. That's how they often referred to the Gentiles. Those people were unclean. They were outside of God. And yet Jesus, in this Jewish-flavored gospel, says, Make disciples of all the nations. Think about the impact that would have had on Jewish readers of the gospel, especially with their long practice of aversion to these unclean Gentiles, these people who had different customs, different uh, backgrounds, different practices, different diets. Everything about them was different and strange and, and even repulsive to some. And yet the message comes through very clearly in all of this, that the gospel is for all people, all nations, everywhere. And so I had to ask myself the question, okay, what, if in reading this gospel message, am I supposed to get out of this story about these three magi? Maybe the question ought to be, who is it that I might have an aversion to, like maybe the Jews did? Who is it that I need to reach out to? It's ironic when I think about this that these magi, who were once thought of as, of as uh, unwise charlatans, people of questionable character, soothsayers, unclean, everyone refers them to them nowadays as wise men, right? And you know what? They were wise because they came to Jesus and acknowledged Him as King. If the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, then they're the most wise people here in the text. And I think that's a comfort to, uh, to all people, no matter what your background is, no matter what you've done, no matter what kind of person you are, that every person can come to Jesus. The door is open to all people. And He will transform you into the image and the beauty of the glory of our Lord. That's the reason Jesus came to this earth. When He came into this world, when He became, uh, became a human being, His purpose was to grow and to teach us what it means to be a follower of God and ultimately to go to the cross and die for our sins and rise up from the grave so that He can provide a way of redemption for us. And if you believe that He came from heaven to earth and you believe that He died on the cross for the remission of your sins and you believe that He rose from the grave and you're ready to accept His rule over your life, then you're ready to go down into the water and be baptized and to be born again. And He'll wash away all of your sins. Now, if I've already done that, if we've already done that, and I think the lesson is simple. Who are the nations? They're not necessarily the people that are way out across the ocean at another place. I know as we look at the gospel that the nations for the Jews are right, were living uh, right in the next neighborhood. They were across the railroad tracks. They may have even been next door. Who are the nations? All people are precious to God. And the re reason all people are precious to God is because all people, all human beings have been created in the image of God. And therefore, all human beings are worthy of dignity. All human beings have inherent beauty. All human beings have inherent glory that came from being a creation of God in His own image. And the only problem is that image has been distorted and twisted by sin. And that is the only solution to sin. That's why Jesus came into this world. We're going to go ahead and sing a song in just a moment. And if you need to respond to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come to the front as we stand and sing the invitation song.